Luka Doncic, a man who claims it's easier to score in the NBA than it is in the EuroLeague, just claimed the Phoenix Suns are the top dogs out west. How much of a threat are the Suns now? <laughs> Probably the favorite in the west, right? Yeah. That's it. Well, but this could be either Doncic gassing up the team he embarrassed back in 2022's Western Conference semis, attempting to put hype on Phoenix's shoulders so the Valley will fold under pressure. But whether you think Luka's gassing up Phoenix or not, two-time finals MVP Kevin Durant undeniably gives Phoenix the perfect assortment of talent in which it takes to win a chip. If Chris Paul can't win a ring in this late career Gary Payton for the Lakers type role, then the State Farm Merchant is unfortunately never going to cap off his Hall of Fame legacy with a ring. How the chemistry will play out between a four-time assist champion in CP3 and a four-time scoring champion in KD is a real concern for me. At least before the Durant trade though, in his later years, it seemed Chris was adjusting into his lesser volume type role pretty well in terms of his ego, but as Derek Rose has, albeit who's now getting DNPs in New York, previous superstars can last in the NBA long after their prime, if they can adapt. Easier said than done, but if Phoenix's chemistry has any chance of working out, with the dictating leadership of Kevin Durant entering the chat, here's what's going to be the key. CP3 will have to continue what he's been doing for the last little while, mentality-wise. The first option dynamic is also going to be interesting between Durant and Booker. Off the court, I'm not worried about the Devin Booker-Kevin Durant dynamic, as Book's shown he can get along with anyone throughout his career. I am worried about KD potentially having to be relied upon most when things get tough. On the court, if the Suns have any shot at achieving the ultimate glory, Devin's going to have to be the opposite of the down-to-earth figure we see outside of the lines for one reason. D-Book needs to be the number one, at the very least, 1A go-to option once Durant gets back from his injury. KD's a key player in the Super Team era, as there's that meme about how Durant gets there when everything's already built. I think those memes are the slightest of disrespectful, however, when you consider Easy Money Sniper's performances were a primary, if not very debatably, which I very much disagree with, the primary driving factor behind Golden State taking home consecutive championships in 2017 and 2018. The Super Team era is a time frame which gets hated on because superstar players request trades when merely the slightest bit of adversity hits like they're playing my career, but failed Super Teams have been more abundant than successful ones is my first point behind enjoying this era. Kobe, Nash, and Dwight, PG, and Westbrook, Westbrook, LeBron, and AD, Kyrie, Durant, and Harden, Harden and CP3, the list goes on and on. The rivalries the Super Team era initiates don't come between the players, but rather the fans of whose player left them and said player, if that makes any sense. In a nutshell, that's why people who hate on LeBron for joining Miami and starting all of this are really naive for that particular standpoint. Don't forget, Paul Pierce told his GM to acquire Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen three years before LeBron's dramatic decision on ESPN took place. Speaking of ESPN, they're actually the ones to blame for this super team era. Let me explain. Stephen A. Smith and Skip Bayless not merely rose to fame in the 2010s with First Take, but they were almost the lone mainstream show at the time that you knew everyone in the NBA and around the NBA in terms of fans, coaches, players, etc. had at least the slightest bit of attention on in some form. Here's why Skip and Stephen A. started the Super Team era, which again, I'm not at all saying is a bad thing, it's the opposite in my humble opinion. I'm stating this to detail why you shouldn't blame LeBron for his decision, and not to patronize or pity James by the way. But Skip and Stephen A would literally only talk about championship rings, day in, day out on the show, judging players solely based off the titles they had, and that only. If you watched First Take regularly throughout the 2010s or late 2000s, coincidentally around LeBron's first unrestricted free agency, then you know what I'm talking about regarding First Take gassing up ring culture. Final point behind why this is far from what some call quote unquote a broken era since LeBron left in 2010. Even though people who claim that would actually be wrong, it actually started 16 years ago in 2007 with Boston's Big Three. 
is that naturally built, you could say traditionally built rosters within the super team era have in the meantime had success and it hasn't been for just a year or two. Yes, the Super Team Heat took it in 2012 and 2013, the Super Team Warriors won it in 2017 and 18, and the Super Team Cavaliers won it in 2016, the Super Team Lakers won it in 2020. And I want to be very clear, I think there's nothing wrong with those titles, and nothing takes away from those rings in any sense. But all since this so-called toxic era started, the loyal Dirk and the Mavs won it, the Kawhi, Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili-led Spurs took home the chip. Another almost strictly drafted roster in the Golden State Warriors won it in both 2015 without Durant and of course 2022 without Durant. All in all though, having top players stack up on one team has always been a thing, whether it's assembled through the front office or through the players. With that narrative out of the way, which I've wanted to get off my chest for a while, now we can properly pay homage to and get into the details of this Suns powerhouse. Movement off the ball within this Monty Williams coach system, as I mentioned in my trade deadline video last time, will make or break this ball club. That said, this labeled as merely top heavy Suns roster isn't the weakest in terms of depth outside of Aiton, Paul, Durant, and Booker. The supporting cast seemed to have initially taken a hit when they lost should be now impactful Brooklyn Net wings in Cam Johnson and Mikhail Bridges. Bridges is a lockdown defender and Cam Johnson is an ever developing sniper, but adding a player I've said in the past who can give you all star caliber production in TJ Warren, who like a lot of players at this deadline, will make his second tenure for a previous organization. Phoenix's bench may just have a chance at being decent. Oklahoma City's locomotive at power forward Darius Baisley was also acquired. Amidst all the hype, the young studs that many put a lot of stock into for the Thunder this year, saying they'd arrived, Baisley flew completely under the radar. While Baisley's year-to-year -year development has taken a downward spiral in terms of his points per game, the fourth-year pro from the hometown of Brockton, Massachusetts, has displayed his much improved versatility up front, averaging 1.23s per game and knocking down 40% of them. The volume of threes Baisley is attempting per 36 minutes is the second highest rate of his career. That three-point stroke, meanwhile, is a career high by over five percentage points. Maybe Mark Dagnalt's should have been playing this man a lot more, but Phoenix nevertheless received a diamond in the rough in Darius because of that potential mistake. Two shoutouts from my last upload and this one next time, but what's the most exciting part about the new look Phoenix Suns? Thanks for watching.